judge us by himself and think it was just a prank. Second, and more important, he'll be afraid to say anything. That's what I'm really counting on. We tell him that if he starts writing letters and making phone calls, we start writing letters and making phone calls. About the execution, Harry said. And about the way he froze when Wharton attacked Dean, Brutal said. I think people finding out about that is what Percy Wetmore's really afraid of. He nodded slowly and thoughtfully. It could work. But, Pa, wouldn't it make more sense to bring Mrs. Moores to coffee than coffee to Mrs. Moores? We could take care of Percy, pretty much the way you laid it out, and bring her in through the tunnel instead of taking coffee out that way. I shook my head. Never happen. Not in a million years. Because of Warden Moores. That's right. He's so hard-headed he makes old Doubting Thomas look like Joan of Arc. If we bring coffee to his house, I think we can surprise him into at least letting coffee make the try. Otherwise, what were you thinking about using for a vehicle? Brutal asked. My first thought was the stagecoach, I said, but we'd never get it out of the yard without being noticed, and everyone within a twenty-mile radius knows what it looks like anyway. I guess maybe we can use my Ford. Guess again! Dean said, popping his specs back onto his nose. You couldn't get John Coffee into your car if you stripped him naked, covered him with lard, and used a shoehorn. You're so used to looking at him that you've forgotten how big he is. I had no reply to that. Most of my attention that morning had been focused on the problem of Percy and the lesser but not inconsiderable problem of Wild Bill Wharton. Now I realized that transportation wasn't going to be as simple as I had hoped. Harry Terwilliger picked up the remains of his second sandwich, looked at it for a second, then put it down again. If we was to actually do this crazy thing, he said, I guess we could use my pickup truck, sit him in the back of that. Wouldn't be nobody much on the roads at that hour. We're talking about well after midnight, ain't we? Yes, I said. You guys are forgetting one thing, Dean said. I know Coffee's been pretty quiet ever since he came on the block. Doesn't do much but lay there on his bunk and leak from the eyes, but he's a murderer. Also, he's huge. If he decided he wanted to escape out of the back of Harry's truck, the only way we could stop him would be to shoot him dead. And a guy like that would take a lot of killing, even with a forty-five. Suppose we weren't able to put him down, and suppose he killed someone else. I'd hate losing my job, and I'd hate going to jail. I got a wife and kids depending on me to put bread in their mouths. But I don't think I'd hate either of those things near as much as having another dead little girl on my conscience. That won't happen, I said. How in God's name can you be so sure of that? I didn't answer. I didn't know just how to begin. I had known this would come up. Of course I did, but I still didn't know how to start telling them what I knew. Brutal helped me. You don't think he did it, do you, Paul? He looked incredulous. You think that big lug is innocent? I'm positive he's innocent, I said. How in the name of Jesus can you be? There are two things, I said. One of them is my shoe. I leaned forward over the table and began talking. Part 5 Night Journey Chapter 1 Mr. H. G. Wells once wrote a story about a man who invented a time machine. And I have discovered that in the writing of these memoirs, I have created my own time machine. Unlike Wells's, it can only travel into the past, back to 1932, as a matter of fact, when I was the bull goose screw in E-block of Cold Mountain State Penitentiary. But it's eerily efficient for all that. Still, this time machine reminds me of the old Ford I had in those days. You could be sure that it would start eventually, 
but you never knew if a turn of the key would be enough to fire the motor, or if you were going to have to get out and crank until your arm practically fell off. I've had a lot of easy starts since I started telling the story of John Coffey, but yesterday I had to crank. I think it was because I'd gotten to Delacroix's execution, and part of my mind didn't want to have to relive that. It was a bad death, a terrible death, and it happened the way it did because of Percy Wetmore, a young man who loved to comb his hair but couldn't stand to be laughed at, not even by a half-bald little Frenchman who was never going to see another Christmas. As with most dirty jobs, however, the hardest part is just getting started. It doesn't matter to an engine whether you use the key or have to crank. Once you get it going, it'll usually run just as sweet either way. That's how it worked for me yesterday. At first the words came in little bursts of phrasing, then in whole sentences, then in a torrent. Writing is a special and rather terrifying form of remembrance, I've discovered. There is a totality to it that seems almost like rape. Perhaps I only feel that way because I've become a very old man, a thing that happened behind my own back, I sometimes think. But I don't think so. I believe that the combination of pencil and memory creates a kind of practical magic, and magic is dangerous. As a man who knew John Coffey and saw what he could do to mice and to men. I feel very qualified to say that. Magic is dangerous. In any case, I wrote all day yesterday, the words simply flooding out of me, the sunroom of this glorified old folks' home gone, replaced by the storage room at the end of the Green Mile, where so many of my problem children took their last sit-me-down, and the bottom of the stairs which led to the tunnel under the road. That was where Dean and Harry and Brutal and I confronted Percy Wetmore over Edouard Delacroix's smoking body, and made Percy renew his promise to put in for transfer to the Briar Ridge State Mental Facility. There are always fresh flowers in the sunroom, but by noon yesterday all I could smell was the noxious aroma of the dead man's cooked flesh. The sound of the power mower down below had been replaced by the hollow plink of dripping water as it seeped slowly through the tunnel's curved roof. The trip was on. I had traveled back to 1932, in soul and mind, if not body. I skipped lunch, wrote until four o'clock or so, and when I finally put my pencil down, my hand was aching. I walked slowly down to the end of the second-floor corridor. There's a window there that looks out on the employee parking lot. Brad Dolan, the guard who reminds me of Percy, and the one who is altogether too curious about where I go and what I do on my walks, drives an old Chevrolet with a bumper sticker that says, I have seen God and his name is Newt. It was gone. Brad's shift was over, and he'd taken himself off to whatever garden spot he calls home. I envision an Airstream trailer with Hustler gatefolds scotch taped to the walls and Dixie beer cans in the corners. I went out through the kitchen where dinner preparations were getting started. What you got in that bag, Mr. Edgecombe? Norton asked me. It's an empty bottle, I said. I've discovered the fountain of youth down there in the woods. I pop down every afternoon about this time and draw a little. I drink it at bedtime. Good stuff, I can tell you. Maybe keeping you young, said George, the other cook, but it ain't doing shit for your looks. We all had a laugh at that, and I went out. I found myself looking around for Dolan, even though his car was gone, called myself a chump for letting him get so far under my skin, and crossed the croquet course. Beyond it is a scraggy little putting green that looks ever so much nicer in the Georgia Pines brochures, and beyond that is a path that winds into the little copse of woods east of the nursing home. There are a couple of old sheds along this path, neither of them used for anything these days. 
At the second, which stands close to the high stone wall between the Georgia Pines grounds and Georgia Highway 47, I went in and stayed for a little while. I ate a good dinner that night, watched a little TV, and went to bed early. On many nights I'll wake up and creep back down to the TV room where I watch old movies on the American Movie Channel. Not last night, though. Last night I slept like a stone, and with none of the dreams that have so haunted me since I started my adventures in literature. All that writing yesterday must have worn me out. I'm not as young as I used to be, you know. When I woke and saw that the patch of sun, which usually lies on the floor at six in the morning, had made it all the way up to the foot of my bed, I hit the deck in a hurry, so alarmed I hardly noticed the arthritic flare of pain in my hips and knees and ankles. I dressed as fast as I could, then hurried down the hall to the window that overlooks the employee's parking lot, hoping the slot where Dolan parks his old Chevrolet would still be empty. Sometimes he's as much as a half hour late. No such luck. The car was there, gleaming rustily in the morning sun. Because Mr. Brad Dolan has something to arrive on time for these days, doesn't he? Yes, old Polly Edgecombe goes somewhere in the early mornings. Old Polly Edgecombe does something, and Mr. Brad Dolan intends to find out what it is. What do you do down there, Polly? Tell me. He would likely be watching for me already. It would be smart to stay right where I was. Except I couldn't. Paul? I turned around so fast I almost fell down. It was my friend Elaine Connolly. Her eyes widened and she put out her hands as if to catch me. Lucky for her, I caught my balance. Elaine's arthritis is terrible, and I probably would have broken her in two like a dry stick if I'd fallen into her arms. Romance doesn't die when you pass into the strange country that lies beyond eighty. But you can forget the gun with the wind crap. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't mean to startle you. That's all right, I said, and gave her a feeble smile. It's a better wake-up than a face full of cold water. I should hire you to do it every morning. You were looking for his car, weren't you? Dolan's car. There was no sense kidding her about it, so I nodded. I wish I could be sure he's over in the West Wing. I'd like to slip out for a little while, but I don't want him to see me. She smiled, a ghost of the teasing imp smile she must have had as a girl, Nosy bastard, isn't he? Yes. He's not in the West Wing, either. I've already been down to breakfast, sleepyhead, and I can tell you where he is because I peeked. He's in the kitchen. I looked at her, dismayed. I had known Dolan was curious, but not how curious. Can you put your morning walk off? Elaine asked. I thought about it. I could, I suppose, but you shouldn't. No, I shouldn't. Now, I thought, she'll ask me where I go, what I have to do down in those woods that's so damned important. But she didn't. Instead, she gave me that imp smile again. It looked strange and absolutely wonderful on her too gaunt, pain-haunted face, "'Do you know Mr. Howland?' she asked. "'Sure,' I said, although I didn't see him much. "'He was in the West Wing, which at Georgia Pines was almost like a neighboring country. "'Why? "'Do you know what's special about him?' "'I shook my head. "'Mr. Howland,' Elaine said, smiling more widely than ever, "'is one of only five residents left at Georgia Pines who have permission to smoke.' That's because he was a resident before the rules changed. A grandfather clause, I thought, and what place was more fitted for one than an old age home? She reached into the pocket of her blue and white striped robe and pulled two items part way out, a cigarette and a book of matches. 
Thief of green, thief of red, she sang in a lilting, funny voice. Little Ellie's going to wet the bed. Elaine, what walking old girl downstairs, she said, putting the cigarette and matches back into her pocket and taking my arm in one of her gnarled hands. We began to walk back down the hall. As we did, I decided to give up and put myself in her hands. She was old and brittle, but not stupid. As we went down, walking with the glassy care of the relics we have now become, Elaine said, Wait at the foot. I'm going over to the West Wing, to the hall toilet there. You know the one I mean, don't you? Yes, I said, the one just outside the spa, but why? I haven't had a cigarette in over fifteen years, she said, but I feel like one this morning. I don't know how many puffs it'll take to set off the smoke detector in there, but I intend to find out. I looked at her with dawning admiration, thinking how much she reminded me of my wife. Jan might have done exactly the same thing. Elaine looked back at me, smiling her saucy imp smile. I cupped my hand around the back of her lovely long neck, drew her face to mine, and kissed her mouth lightly. "'I love you, Ellie,' I said. "'Ooh, such big talk,' she said, but I could tell she was pleased. "'What about Chuck Howland?' I asked. "'Is he going to get in trouble?' "'No, because he's in the TV room watching Good Morning America with about two dozen other folks. "'And I'm going to make myself scarce as soon as the smoke detector turns on the West Wing fire alarm.' "'Don't you fall down and hurt yourself, woman. I'd never forgive myself if—' "'Oh, stop your fussing,' she said. And this time she kissed me. "'Love among the ruins.' "'It probably sounds funny to some of you and grotesque to the rest of you, but—' I'll tell you something, my friend. Weird love's better than no love at all. I watched her walk away, moving slowly and stiffly, but she will only use a cane on wet days, and only then if the pain is terrible, it's one of her vanities, and waited. Five minutes went by, then ten, and just as I was deciding she had either lost her courage or discovered that the battery of the smoke detector in the toilet was dead— the fire alarm went off in the west wing with a loud, buzzing burr. I started toward the kitchen at once, but slowly. There was no reason to hurry until I was sure Dolan was out of my way. A gaggle of old folks, most still in their robes, came out of the TV room. Here it's called the Resource Center. Now that's grotesque to see what was going on. Chuck Howland was among them, I was happy to see. Edgecombe! Kent Avery rasped, hanging onto his walker with one hand and yanking obsessively at the crotch of his pajama pants with the other. Real alarm or just another falsy? What do you think? No way of knowing, I guess, I said. Just about then, three orderlies went trotting past, all headed for the west wing, yelling at the folks clustered around the TV room door to go outside and wait for the all-clear. The third in line was Brad Dolan. He didn't even look at me as he went past, a fact that pleased me to no end. As I went on down toward the kitchen, it occurred to me that the team of Elaine Connolly and Paul Edgecombe would probably be a match for a dozen Brad Dolans, with half a dozen Percy Wetmores thrown in for good measure. The cooks in the kitchen were continuing to clear up breakfast, paying no attention to the howling fire alarm at all. Say, Mr. Edgecombe, George said, I believe Brad Dolan been looking for you. In fact, you just missed him. Lucky me, I thought. What I said out loud was that I'd probably see Mr. Dolan later. Then I asked if there was any leftover toast lying around from breakfast. Sure, Norton said, but it's stone cold dead in the market. You running late this morning. I am, I agreed, but I'm hungry. Only take a minute to make some fresh and hot, George said, reaching for the bread. Nope, cold will be just fine, I said. And when he handed me a couple of slices, looking mystified, actually both of them looked mystified, I hurried out the door, feeling like the boy I once was, skipping school to go fishing with a jelly fold-over wrapped in waxed paper slipped into the front of my shirt. 
Outside the kitchen door, I took a quick, reflexive look around for Dolan, saw nothing to alarm me, and hurried across the croquet course and putting green gnawing on one of my pieces of toast as I went. I slowed a little as I entered the shelter of the woods, and as I walked down the path, I found my mind turning to the day after Edouard Delacroix's terrible execution. I had spoken to Hal Moores that morning, and he had told me that Melinda's brain tumor had caused her to lapse into bouts of cursing and foul language, what my wife had later labeled, rather tentatively, she wasn't sure it was really the same thing, as Tourette's syndrome. The quavering in his voice, coupled with the memory of how John Coffey had healed both my urinary infection and the broken back of Delacroix's pet mouse— had finally pushed me over the line that runs between just thinking about a thing and actually doing a thing. And there was something else, something that had to do with John Coffey's hands and my shoe. So I had called the men I worked with, the men I had trusted my life to over the years, Dean Stanton, Harry Terwilliger, Brutus Howell. They came to lunch at my house on the day after Delacroix's execution, and they at least listened to me when I outlined my plan. Of course, they all knew that Coffee had healed the mouse. Brutal had actually seen it. So when I suggested that another miracle might result if we took John Coffee to Melinda Moore's, they didn't outright laugh. It was Dean Stanton who raised the most troubling question— what if John Coffey escaped while we had him out on his field trip? Suppose he killed someone else, Dean asked. I'd hate losing my job, and I'd hate going to jail. I got a wife and kids depending on me to put bread in their mouths. But I don't think I'd hate either of those things near as much as having another little dead girl on my conscience. There was silence then, all of them looking at me, waiting to see how I'd respond. I knew everything would change if I said what was on the tip of my tongue. We had reached a point beyond which retreat would likely become impossible. Except retreat for me, at least, was already impossible. I opened my mouth and said, Chapter 2 That Won't Happen "'How in God's name can you be so sure of that?' Dean asked. I didn't answer. I didn't know just how to begin. I had known this would come up. Of course I had, but I still didn't know how to start telling them what was in my head and heart. Brutal helped. "'You don't think he did it, do you, Paul?' He looked incredulous. "'You think that big lug is innocent?' I'm positive he's innocent, I said. How in the name of Jesus can you be? There are two things, I said. One of them is my shoe. Your shoe? Brutal exclaimed. What in God's name has your shoe got to do with whether or not John Coffey killed those two little girls? I took off one of my shoes and gave it to him last night, I said. After the execution, this was when things had settled back down a little. I pushed it through the bars, and he picked it up on those big hands of his. I told him to tie it. I had to make sure, you see, because all our problem children normally wear is slippers. A man who really wants to commit suicide can do it with shoelaces if he's dedicated. That's something all of us know. They were nodding. He put it on his lap and got the ends of the laces crossed over all right, but then he was stuck. He said he was pretty sure someone had showed him how to do it when he was a lad, maybe his father or maybe one of the boyfriends his mother had after the father was gone, but he'd forgot the knack. I'm with Brutal. I still don't see what your shoe has to do with whether or not Coffee killed the Dedrick twins, Dean said. So I went over the story of the abduction and murder again, what I'd read that hot day in the prison library with my groin sizzling and gibbons snoring in the corner, and all that the reporter Hammersmith told me later. The Dederick's dog wasn't much of a biter, but it was a world-class barker, I said. The man who took the girls kept it quiet by feeding it sausages. 
He crept a little closer every time he gave it one, I imagine, and while the mutt was eating the last one, he reached out, grabbed it by the head, and twisted, broke its neck. Later, when they caught up with coffee, the deputy in charge of the posse, Rob McGee, his name was, spotted a bulge in the chest pocket of the Bibbals coffee was wearing. McGee thought at first it might be a gun. Coffee said it was a lunch, and that's what it turned out to be, a couple of sandwiches and a pickle, wrapped up in newspaper and tied with butcher's string. Coffee couldn't remember who gave it to him, only that it was a woman wearing an apron. Sandwiches and a pickle, but no sausages, Brutal said. No sausages, I agreed. Course not, Dean said. He fed those to the dog. Well, that's what the prosecutor said at the trial, I agreed. But if Coffee opened his lunch and fed the sausages to the dog, how'd he tie the newspaper back up again with that butcher's twine? I don't know when he even would have had the chance, but leave that out of it for the time being. This man can't even tie a simple granny knot. There was a long moment of thunderstruck silence, broken at last by Brutus. Holy shit, he said in a low voice. How come no one brought that up at the trial? Nobody thought of it, I said, and found myself again thinking of Hammersmith, the reporter. Hammersmith, who had been to college in Bowling Green. Hammersmith, who liked to think of himself as enlightened. Hammersmith, who had told me that mongrel dogs and negroes were about the same, that either might take a chomp out of you suddenly and for no reason. Except he kept calling them your negroes, as if they were still property, but not his property. No, not his, never his. And at that time the South was full of Hammersmiths. Nobody was really equipped to think of it, Coffee's own attorney included. But you did, Harry said. God damn, boys, we're sitting here with Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He sounded simultaneously joshing and awed. Oh, put a cork in it, I said. I wouldn't have thought of it either if I hadn't put together what he told Deputy McGee that day with what he said after he cured my infection, and what he said after he healed the mouse. What? Dean said. When I went into his cell, it was like I was hypnotized. I didn't feel like I could have stopped doing what he wanted, even if I'd tried. I don't like the sound of that, Harry said, and shifted uneasily in his seat. I asked him what he wanted, and he said, just to help. I remember that very clearly. And when it was over and I was better, he knew. I helped it, he said. I helped it, didn't I? Brutal was nodding. Just like with the mouse. You said you helped it, and Coffee said it back to you like he was a parrot. I helped Dell's mouse. Is that when you knew? It was, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess so. I remembered what he said to McGee when McGee asked him what had happened. It was in every story about the murders just about. I couldn't help it. I tried to take it back, but it was too late. A man saying a thing like that with two little dead girls in his arms, them white and blonde, him as big as a house, no wonder they got it wrong. They heard what he was saying in a way that would agree with what they were seeing, and what they were seeing was black. They thought he was confessing that he was saying he'd had a compulsion to take those girls, rape them, and kill them, that he'd come to his senses and tried to stop. But by then it was too late, Brutal murmured. Yes, except what he was really trying to tell them was that he'd found them, tried to heal them, to bring them back, and had no success. They were too far gone in death. Paul, do you believe that? Dean asked, do you really, honest to God, believe that? I examined my heart as well as I could one final time, then nodded my head. Not only did I know it now, there was an intuitive part of me that had known something wasn't right with John Coffey's situation from the very beginning, when Percy had come onto the block, hauling on Coffey's arm and blaring, dead man walking at the top of his lungs. I had shaken hands with him, hadn't I? I had never shaken the hand of a man coming on the green mile before, but I had shaken coffees. Jesus, Dean said. 
Good Jesus Christ. Your shoe's one thing, Harry said. What's the other? Not long before the posse found coffee in the girls, the men came out of the woods near the south bank of the Trapingus River. They found a patch of flattened-down grass there, a lot of blood, and the rest of Cora Dederick's nighty. The dogs got confused for a bit. Most wanted to go southeast, downstream along the bank, but two of them, the coon dogs, wanted to go upstream. Bobo Marchand was running the dogs, and when he gave the coonies a sniff of the nightgown, they turned with the others. The coonies got mixed up, didn't they? Brutal asked. A strange, sickened little smile was playing around the corners of his mouth. They ain't built to be trackers, strictly speaking, and they got mixed up on what their job was. Yes. I don't get it, Dean said. The coonies forgot whatever it was Bobo ran under their noses to get them started, Brutal said. By the time they came out on the riverbank, the coonies were tracking the killer, not the girls. That wasn't a problem as long as the killer and the girls were together. But the light was dawning in Dean's eyes. Harry had already gotten it. When you think about it, I said, you wonder how anybody, even a jury wanting to pin the crime on a wandering black fellow, could have believed John Coffey was their man for even a minute. Just the idea of keeping the dog quiet with food until he could snap its neck would have been beyond Coffey. He was never any closer to the Dederick farm than the south bank of the Trapingus, that's what I think, six or more miles away. He was just mooning along, maybe meaning to go down to the railroad tracks and catch a freight to somewhere else. When they come off the trestle, they're going slow enough to hop, when he heard a commotion to the north. The killer? Brutal asked. The killer. He might have raped them already, or maybe the rape was what Coffee heard. In any case, that bloody patch in the grass was where the killer finished the business, dashed their heads together, dropped them, and then hightailed it. Hightailed it northwest, Brutal said, the direction the coon dogs wanted to go. Right. John Coffey comes through a stand of alders that grows a little way southeast of the spot where the girls were left, probably curious about all the noise, and he finds their bodies. One of them might still have been alive. I suppose it's possible both of them were, although not for much longer. John Coffey wouldn't have known if they were dead, that's for sure. All he knows is that he's got a healing power in his hands, and he tried to use it on Cora and Kathy Detterick. When it didn't work, he broke down, crying and hysterical, which is how they found him. Why didn't he stay there, where he found them? Brutal asked. Why take them south along the riverbank? Any idea? I bet he did stay put at first, I said. At the trial, they kept talking about a big, trampled area, all the grass squashed flat, and John Coffey's a big man. John Coffey's a fucking giant, Harry said, pitching his voice very low so my wife wouldn't hear him cuss if she happened to be listening. Maybe he panicked when he saw that what he was doing wasn't working. Or maybe he got the idea that the killer was still there, in the woods, upstream, watching him. Coffee's big, you know, but not real brave. Harry, remember him asking if we left a light on in the block after bedtime? Yeah, I remember thinking how funny that was, what with the size of him. Harry looked shaken and thoughtful. Well, if he didn't kill the little girls, who did? Dean asked. I shook my head. Someone else? Someone white would be my best guess. The prosecutor made a big deal about how it would have taken a strong man to kill a dog as big as the one the Dedericks kept, but that's crap, Brutus rumbled. A twelve-year-old girl could break a big dog's neck if she took the dog by surprise and knew where to grab. If coffee didn't do it, it could have been damn near anyone, any man, that is. We'll probably never know, I said, unless he does it again. We wouldn't know even then if he did it down Texas or in California, Harry said. Brutal leaned back, screwed his fists into his eyes like a tired child, then dropped them into his lap again. This is a nightmare, he said. We've got a man who may be innocent, who probably is innocent, and he's going to walk the green mile, just as sure as God made tall trees and little fishes. What are we supposed to do about it? If we start in with that healing finger shit, everyone's going to laugh their asses off, and he'll end up in the fry-o later just the same. Let's worry about that later. 
I said, because I didn't have the slightest idea how to answer him. The question right now is what we do or don't do about Melly. I'd say step back and take a few days to think it over, but I think every day we wait raises the chances that he won't be able to help her. Remember him holding his hands out for the mouse? Brutal asked. Give him to me while there's still time, he said. While there's still time. I remember. Brutal considered, then nodded. I'm in. I feel bad about Mel, too, but mostly I think I just want to see what happens when he touches her. Probably nothing will, but maybe... I doubt like hell we even get the big dummy off the block, Harry said, then sighed and nodded. But who gives a shit? Count me in. Me too, Dean said. Who stays on the block, Paul? Do we draw straws for it? No, sir, I said. No straws. You stay. Just like that? The hell you say, Dean replied, hurt and angry. He whipped off his spectacles and began to polish them furiously on his shirt. What kind of a bum deal is that? The kind you get if you're young enough to have kids still in school, Brutal said. Harry and me's bachelors. Paul's married, but his kids are grown and off on their own, at least. This is a mucho crazy stunt we're planning here. I think we're almost sure to get caught. He gazed at me soberly. One thing you didn't mention, Paul, is that if we do manage to get him out of the slam and then Coffee's healing fingers don't work, Hal Moore's is apt to turn us in himself. He gave me a chance to reply to this, maybe to rebut it, but I couldn't, and so I kept my mouth shut. Brutal turned back to Dean and went on. Don't get me wrong, you're apt to lose your job, too. But at least you'd have a chance to get clear of prison if the heat really came down. Percy's going to think it was a prank. If you're on the duty desk, you can say you thought the same thing and we never told you any different. I still don't like it, Dean said, but it was clear he'd go along with it, like it or not. The thought of his kiddies had convinced him. And it's to be tonight? You're sure? If we're going to do it, it had better be tonight, Harry said. If I get a chance to think about it, I'll most likely lose my nerve. Let me be the one to go by the infirmary, Dean said. I can do that much, at least, can I? As long as you can do what needs doing without getting caught, Brutal said. Dean looked offended, and I clapped him on the shoulder. As soon after you clock in as you can, all right? You bet. My wife popped her head through the door as if I'd given her a cue to do so. Who's for more iced tea? she asked brightly. What about you, Brutus? No, thanks, he said. What I'd like is a good hard knock of whiskey, but under the circumstances that might not be a good idea. Janice looked at me, smiling mouth, worried eyes. What are you getting these boys into, Paul? But before I could even think of framing a reply, she raised her hand and said, Never mind, I don't want to know. Chapter 3 Later, long after the others were gone and while I was dressing for work, she took me by the arm, swung me around, and looked into my eyes with fierce intensity. Melinda? she asked. I nodded. Can you do something for her, Paul? Really do something for her? Or is it all wishful dreaming brought on by what you saw last night? I thought of Coffee's eyes, of Coffee's hands, and of the hypnotized way I'd gone to him when he'd wanted me. I thought of him holding out his hand for Mr. Jingle's broken, dying body. While there's still time, he had said, and the black swirling things that turned white and disappeared. I think we might be the only chance she has left, I said at last. Then take it, she said, buttoning the front of my new fall coat. It had been in the closet since my birthday at the beginning of September, but this was only the third or fourth time I'd actually worn it. Take it. And she practically pushed me out the door. Chapter 4 I clocked in that night, in many ways the strangest night of my entire life, at twenty past six. I thought I could still smell the faint, lingering odor of burned flesh on the air. It had to be an illusion. The doors to the outside, both on the block and in the storage room, had been open most of the day, and the previous two shifts had spent hours scrubbing in there. 
But that didn't change what my nose was telling me, and I didn't think I could have eaten any dinner even if I hadn't been scared almost to death about the evening which lay ahead. Brutal came on the block at quarter to seven, Dean at ten till. I asked Dean if he would go over to the infirmary and see if they had a heating pad for my back, which I seemed to have strained that early morning helping to carry Delacroix's body down into the tunnel. Dean said he'd be happy to. I believe he wanted to tip me a wink, but restrained himself. Harry clocked on at three minutes to seven. The truck? I asked. Where we talked about? So far, so good. There followed a little passage of time when we stood by the duty desk, drinking coffee and studiously not mentioning what we were all thinking and hoping, that Percy was late, that maybe Percy wasn't going to show up at all. Considering the hostile reviews he'd gotten on the way he'd handled the electrocution, that seemed at least possible. But Percy apparently subscribed to that old axiom about how you should get right back on the horse that had thrown you, because here he came through the door at six minutes past seven, resplendent in his blue uniform, with his sidearm on one hip and his hickory stick in its ridiculous custom-made holster on the other. He punched his time card, then looked around at us warily, except for Dean, who hadn't come back from the infirmary yet. "'My starter busted,' he said. "'I had to crank.' Ah, oh, Harry said, Paul baby. Should have stayed home and got the cussed thing fixed, Brule said blandly. We wouldn't want you straining your arm none, would we, boys? Yeah, he'd like that, wouldn't you? Percy sneered, but I thought he seemed reassured by the relative mildness of Brutal's response. That was good. For the next few hours, we'd have to walk a line with him. Not too hostile but not too friendly, either. After last night, he'd find anything even approaching warmth suspect. We weren't going to get him with his guard down, we all knew that, but I thought we could catch him with it a long piece from all the way up if we played things just right. It was important that we move fast, but it was also important, to me at least, that nobody be hurt, not even Percy Wetmore. Dean came back and gave me a little nod. Percy, I said. I want you to go on in the storeroom and mop down the floor, stairs to the tunnel, too, then you can write your report on last night. That should be creative, Brutal remarked, hooking his thumbs into his belt and looking up at the ceiling. You guys are funnier in a fucking church, Percy said. But beyond that, he didn't protest. Didn't even point out the obvious, which was that the floor in there had already been washed at least twice that day. My guess is that he was glad for the chance to be away from us. I went over the previous shift report, saw nothing that concerned me, and then took a walk down to Wharton's cell. He was sitting there on his bunk with his knees drawn up and his arms clasped around his shins, looking at me with a bright, hostile smile. "'Well, if it ain't the big boss,' he said, "'big as life and twice as ugly. You look happier than a pig knee-deep in shit, boss Edgecombe. Wife give you a pecker a pull before you left home, did she?' "'How you doing, kid?' I asked evenly, and at that he brightened for real. He let go of his legs, stood up, and stretched. His smile broadened, and some of the hostility went out of it. Well, damn, he said. You got my name right for once. What's the matter with you, Boss Edgecombe? You sick or something? No, not sick. I'd been sick, but John Coffey had taken care of that. His hands no longer knew the trick of tying a shoe if they ever had, but they knew other tricks. Yes, indeed, they did. My friend, I told him, if you want to be a Billy the Kid instead of a Wild Bill, it's all the same to me. He puffed visibly, like one of those loathsome fish that live in South American rivers and can sting you almost to death with the spines along their backs and sides. I dealt with a lot of dangerous men during my time on the mile, but few if any so repellent as William Wharton, who considered himself a great outlaw, but whose jailhouse behavior rarely rose above pissing or spitting through the bars of his cell. So far we hadn't given him the awed respect he felt was his by right. But on that particular night I wanted him tractable. If that meant lathering on the soft soap, I would gladly lather it on. I got a lot in common with the kid, and you just better believe it. Wharton said, I didn't get here for stealing candy out of a dime store. 
as proud as a man who's been conscripted into the hero's brigade of the French Foreign Legion, instead of one whose ass has been slammed into a cell seventy long steps from the electric chair. Where's my supper? Come on, kid. Report says you had it at 5.50. Meatloaf with gravy, mashed peas. You don't con me that easy. He laughed expansively and sat down on his bunk again. Put on the radio, then. He said radio in the way people did back then when they were joking, so it rhymed with the fifties slang word daddio. It's funny how much a person can remember about times when his nerves were tuned so tight they almost sang. Maybe later, big boy, I said. I stepped away from his cell and looked down the corridor. Brutal had strolled down to the far end where he checked to make sure the restraint room door was on the single lock instead of the double. I knew it was because I'd already checked it myself. Later on, we'd want to be able to open that door as quick as we could. There would be no time spent emptying out the attic-type rickrack that had accumulated in there over the years. We'd taken it out, sorted it, and stored it in other places not long after Wharton joined our happy band. It had seemed to us the room with the soft walls was apt to get a lot of use, at least until Billy the Kid strolled the mile. John Coffey, who would usually have been lying down at this time, long, thick legs dangling and face to the wall, was sitting on the end of his bunk with his hands clasped, watching Brutal with an alertness, a thereness, that wasn't typical of him. He wasn't leaking around the eyes, either. Brutal tried the door to the restraint room and came on back up the mile. He glanced at Coffee as he passed Coffee's cell, and Coffee said a curious thing. Sure, I'd like a ride. As if responding to something Brutal had said. Brutal's eyes met mine. He knows. I could almost hear him saying, somehow he knows. I shrugged and spread my hands as if to say, of course he knows. Chapter 5 Old Toot Toot made his last trip of the night down to E Block with his cart at about quarter to nine. We bought enough of his crap to make him smile with avarice. Say, you boys seen that mouse? he asked. We shook our heads. Maybe Pretty Boy has. Toot said, and gestured with his head in the direction of the storage room, where Percy was either washing the floor, or writing his report, or picking his ass. "'What do you care? It's none of your affair either way,' Brutal said. "'Roll wheels, Toot. You're stinking the place up.' Toot smiled his peculiarly unpleasant smile, toothless and sunken, and made a business of sniffing the air. "'That ain't me you smell,' he said. "'That be Dell, saying so long.' Cackling, he rolled his cart out the door and into the exercise yard. And he went on rolling it for another ten years, long after I was gone. Hell, long after Cold Mountain was gone, selling moon pies and pops to the guards and prisoners who could afford them. Sometimes even now I hear him in my dreams, yelling that he's frying, he is frying, he's a dun tum turkey. The time stretched out after Toot was gone, the clock seeming to crawl. We had the radio for an hour and a half. Wharton braying laughter at Fred Allen and Allen's Alley, even though I doubt like hell he understood many of the jokes. John Coffey sat on the end of his bunk, hands clasped, eyes rarely leaving whoever was at the duty desk. I've seen men waiting that way in bus stations for their buses to be called. Percy came in from the storage room around quarter to eleven and handed me a report which had been laboriously written in pencil. Eraser crumbs lay over the sheet of paper in gritty smears. He saw me run my thumb over one of these and said hastily, That's just a first pass, like. I'm going to copy it over. What do you think? What I thought was that it was the most outrageous goddamn whitewash I'd read in all my born days. What I told him was that it was fine and he went away satisfied. Dean and Harry played cribbage, talking too loud, squabbling over the count too often, and looking at the crawling hands of the clock every five seconds or so. On at least one of their games that night, they appeared to go around the board three times instead of twice. 
There was so much tension in the air that I felt I could almost have carved it like clay, and the only people who didn't seem to feel it were Percy and Wild Bill. When it got to be ten of twelve, I could stand it no longer and gave Dean a little nod. He went into my office with a bottle of R.C. Cola bought off Toot's cart and came back out a minute or two later. The cola was now in a tin cup, which a prisoner can't break and then slash with. I took it and glanced around. Harry, Dean, and Brutal were all watching me. So, for that matter, was John Coffey. Not Percy, though. Percy had returned to the storage room, where he probably felt more at ease on this particular night. I gave the tin cup a quick sniff and got no odor except for the R.C., which had an odd but pleasant cinnamon smell back in those days. I took it down to Wharton's cell. He was lying on his bunk. He wasn't masturbating, yet, anyway, but had raised quite a boner inside his shorts and was giving it a good healthy twang every now and again, like a dopey bass fiddler hammering an extra thick E-string. Kid, I said. Don't bother me, he said. Okay, I agreed. I brought you a pop for behaving like a human being all night, damn near a record for you, but I'll just drink it myself. I made as if to do just that, raising the tin cup battered all up and down the sides from many angry bangings on many sets of cell bars to my lips. Wharton was off the bunk in a flash, which didn't surprise me. It wasn't a high-risk bluff. Most deep cons, lifers, rapists, and the men slated for old Sparky are pigs for their sweets, and this one was no exception. "'Give me that, ye clunk!' Wharton said. He spoke as if he were the foreman and I was just another lowly peon. "'Give it to the kid!' I held it just outside the bars, letting him be the one to reach through. Doing it the other way around is a recipe for disaster, as any long-time prison screw will tell you. That was the kind of stuff we thought of without even knowing we were thinking of it. The way we knew not to let the cons call us by our first names. The way we knew that the sound of rapidly jingling keys meant trouble on the block, because it was the sound of a prison guard running, and prison guards never run unless there's trouble in the valley. Stuff Percy Wetmore was never going to get wise to. Tonight, however, Wharton had no interest in grabbing or choking. He snatched the tin cup, downed the pop in three long swallows, then voiced a resounding belch. Excellent, he said. I held my hand out. Cup. He held it for a moment, teasing with his eyes. Suppose I keep it. I shrugged. We'll come in and take it back. You'll go down to the little room and you will have drunk your last R.C., unless they serve it down in hell, of course. His smile faded. I don't like jokes about hell, screw tip. He thrust the cup out through the bars. Here, take it. I took it. From behind me, Percy said, Why in God's name did you want to give a lagoon like him a soda pop? Because it was loaded with enough infirmary dope to put him on his back for forty-eight hours, and he never tasted a thing, I thought. With Paul, Brutal said, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth like the gentle rain from heaven. Huh? Percy asked, frowning. Means he's a soft touch, always has been, always will be. Want to play a game of Crazy Eights, Percy? Percy snorted. Except for goldfish and old maid, that's the stupidest card game ever made. That's why I thought you might like a few hands, Brutal said, smiling sweetly. Everybody's a Weisenheimer, Percy said, and sulked off into my office. I didn't care much for the little rat parking his ass behind my desk, but I kept my mouth shut. The clock crawled. Twelve twenty. Twelve thirty. At twelve forty, John Coffey got up off his bunk and stood at his cell door, hands grasping the bars loosely. Brutal and I walked down to Wharton's cell and looked in. He lay there on his bunk, smiling up at the ceiling. His eyes were open, but they looked like big glass balls. One hand lay on his chest, the other dangled limply off the side of his bunk, knuckles brushing the floor. Gosh, Brutal said, from Billy the Kid to Willie the Weeper in less than an hour. I wonder how many of those morphine pills Dean put in that tonic. Enough, I said. There was a little tremble in my voice. I don't know if Brutal heard it, but I sure did. 
Come on, we're going to do it. You don't want to wait for Beautiful there to pass out? He's passed out now, Brute. He's just too buzzed to close his eyes. Yo, the boss. He looked around for Harry, but Harry was already there. Dean was sitting bolt upright at the duty desk, shuffling the cards so hard and fast it was a wonder they didn't catch fire, throwing a little glance to his left at my office with every flutter shuffle, keeping an eye out for Percy. Is it time? Harry asked. His long, horsey face was very pale above his blue uniform blouse, but he looked determined. Yes, I said. If we're going through with it, it's time. Harry crossed himself and kissed his thumb. Then he went down to the restraint room, unlocked it, and came back with a straitjacket. He handed it to Brutal. The three of us walked up the green mile. Coffee stood at his cell door, watching us go, and said not a word. When we reached the duty desk, Brutal put the straitjacket behind his back, which was broad enough to conceal it easily. Luck, Dean 